Hello and welcome to Chapter 3, Evolution, Biodiversity, and Population Ecology. Okay, evolution. So, uh, a species. A species is a population or a group of populations whose members share certain characteristics and can reproduce freely. Okay, a population is a group of individuals of a particular species who live in a certain area. Okay, so, evolution and natural selection. Evolution is basically genetic changes over time within a certain species. And natural selection is essentially the idea of survival of the fittest, where some survive and others don't based on certain characteristics. Uh, when talking about natural selection and evolution, the two main scientists you want to focus on are Darwin and Wallace, and that's what the book goes over. So basically, together, they come up with a few generalizations about the topics that are pretty important. So first, organisms face a constant struggle to survive and reproduce. Second, organisms tend to produce more offspring than can survive. Third, individuals of a species vary in characteristics. And fourth, the general adaption of new traits. Okay, uh, genetic variation. So let's look at mutations. So a mutation is basically an accidental change in DNA. And when you have uh, mutations occur, this causes genetic variation among individuals and down the road can lead to long-term adaptions and changes within a species itself. If you looked out at the visual here, we can discuss directional selection versus stabilizing selection versus disruptive selection. Okay, so let's start in the middle. We can use the exact example that the book discusses, so let's talk about uh, snail shells. So in the directional selection um, area, so basically uh, directional selection refers to a favored trait. So say in the case of the snail, um, a thick shell being much preferred to a thin shell, so the thick shell wins out. However, if you look at a stabilizing selection, that's where um, instead of picking like the very thickest shell or the very thinnest shell, there's some kind of compromise, and that's how you end up right in the middle with a medium thick shell. However, if you look at disruptive selection, this is when both extremes are used, so that's why there are two humps here, basically. So they have the very thick shell being very effective and the very thin shell being very effective, and so both went out and both still occur. Okay, environmental pressures. So environmental pressures can influence adaption of traits and evolution both. Okay, so let's look at convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is when very unrelated species have similar traits as a result of similar environmental pressures. So let's look down at these two cactuses here. Both are cactuses, yes, but they're both very different and they both live in very different parts of the world. However, because the environments are similar, the cactuses end up looking very, very alike. Okay, let's look at artificial selection and selective breeding. So uh, two good examples uh, that you can characterize this as are uh, breeding dogs and creating different variations of crops such as corn. So basically, uh, this can be looked at as human control of the breeding of dogs or the making of new crops such as corn. So when looking at dogs, all dogs have the ability to recreate and produce offspring, um, but how it becomes artificial selection and selective breeding is by humans picking certain characteristics that they want and breeding a dog intentionally for that purpose. In the case of a corn crop or another crop, um, we genetically modify the genes of these plants in order to make them have more kernels and grow faster in different environments. And so that's another good example of selective breeding and artificial selection. Okay, biodiversity and speciation. So biodiversity is a very broad term, but basically that refers to the variety of life living all across all levels of organization, such as a population, a community, etc. Okay, uh, speciation. That's the process of basically creating a new species. So uh, if you refer to the diagram here, you can kind of break it down. So basically it starts off with a physical separation. So one species, say the rabbit in this case, lives on this side of the river. However, a river forms and, par and uh, some of the rabbits move to this side of the river. Now, since there's a physical barrier, the two rabbits split and they begin to, um, over time, have mutations in their DNA. And the problem is that once this splits and the DNA begins to mutate, they won't be able to, uh, again, produce like fertile offspring. So you can see the ancestral population, and then you can see the two different ones here. Okay, so population separation and phylogenetic trees. Okay, so when again speaking about population separation, there's basically a test to see if the population has actually separated and speciation has occurred. So say uh, the separation like with the rabbits that we just spoke about happens. Um, if somehow the rabbit populations rejoin and they're still able to recreate and reproduce fertile offspring, then um, speciation has not occurred and they haven't fully separated. 
However, if they uh, do come back together and they are no longer, no longer able to reproduce, two different species have now been formed. Okay, so then you can look at phylogenetic trees down here. So basically this is a very important um, biology concept where you can trace basically the lineage of certain uh, animals and see how they um, have traced to more modern variations um, based off of the same ancestor. So these are like very helpful tools that you can use to trace. Okay, extinction. So um, when uh, discussing extinction, um, some species are far more vulnerable than others. So for instance, the word endemic is a good word to know. So that basically means um, an endemic species is a species that only lives in one very specific place. And so if a species is uh, endemic, then that if something happens to that one place, then the whole species could easily be wiped out because there's not different populations. Uh, moreover, an unstable or uh, a more unstable species, species such as something in that realm would also be pretty susceptible to extinction. Um, when looking at major mass extinctions in history, there's been five, essentially, and they're spread throughout history. And uh, when you average them all together, at any one point, these uh, mass extinctions kill between 50 and 95% of all species at any given time in history, which is incredibly significant. Um, and then, obviously, the very... Um, clear one that we all are probably pretty familiar with is 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs uh, went extinct. Okay, ecology. So ecology is basically the study of interactions among organisms between environments and organisms. So uh, let's take a look at the different levels. Okay, so the biosphere is basically the total of all living things and their environments. So that's like the very broad scheme. Then you can work your way down to population ecology, which refers to major shifts not based on the individual, but based on the entire population. You can then go to community ecology and ecosystem ecology, which basically follows the same trends as population ecology, but referring to community and ecosystem, so they're more specific. Um, now we can look at the difference between specialists and generalists. So a specialist is basically an organism that has very specific needs and can only live in a very specific climate. And so this makes them incredibly susceptible to extinction because if something goes wrong, which they need basically to survive, then they go extinct. However, if you look at a generalist, that's a very, they need uh, fewer things to survive so they can live, say, between like a much broader temperature range and things like that. And that makes them much more adaptable to uh, different environments and changes. Okay, so here's just a simple diagram just showing the level of ecology. So it goes from biosphere all the way down to individual organisms, if you just wanted to look at that quickly. Okay, uh, let's look at population characteristics here. So uh, there are three main basic things that we're gonna look at uh, within population characteristics. So first, let's look at population size. So basically, uh, a population size can grow, it can shrink, and it can remain constant. Uh, when you're looking at population density, that basically refers to the number of individuals living per unit area. So basically, if there's a low population density, although there are gonna be uh, extra resources for each individual organism, it's going to be harder for those organisms to reproduce because it'll be harder for them to find a mate. On the flip side, uh, if you have a higher population density, there's going to be um, a plethora of mates uh, to reproduce with. However, there's going to be a depletion of resources. Now, if we look at population distribution, that's what this diagram down here refers to. So if you look at clump distribution, that's when orga organisms excuse me, live in different clumps within the ecosystem. If you look at uniform uh, distribution, that's when everyone is evenly spaced, essentially. And then if you look at random, everyone is just kind of randomly around. And these all have their pros and cons regarding resource depletion and everything. Okay, so uh, a couple more things we're going to look at within the population ecology here. Uh, so sex ratio, basically a, a maximum growth potential at that would be if there's a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, age structure, it's pretty self-explanatory. It basically refers to the um, age groups or age brackets within the population. And uh, in chapter 8, we're going to go more in-depth with those, but it's just like a very general outlook in this chapter. Uh, and then you can look at birth and death rates, and those are basically uh, graphed on things called survivorship curves, which is over here. And so you have three different sections on this, basically, that you can look at, and that just shows um, relative survivors compared to uh, maximum life expectancy and things like that. Okay, so here's a, a pretty important equation that you should know that you can fill in numbers to throughout... Um, AP Environmental Science. So this is referring to uh, population growth rate. So basically the way it works, there's an example in the book that you can fill in numbers with, but the general formula would be the crude birth rate minus the crude death rate plus immigration rate minus emigration rate 
equals population growth. So um, it's pretty uh, simple to remember because it's just you group birth and death rate and then immigration and emigration. But um, that's something you really should make sure you know because that's going to keep coming up. Okay, so here we have two graphs. Okay, so the one on the left, this refers to exponential growth. So exponential growth, also known as a, a J-curve, is just continual growth. So the population is going to keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, which is unrealistic and won't really happen in nature because there will eventually be a depletion of resources. But um, that's what that graph looks like. The more realistic one that I'm going to say most um, of uh, organisms experience uh, is known as a logistic curve. So basically how this works is here's the exponential growth section, but then you can kind of see how it begins to level off. And this line K here represents the carrying capacity. So that's about the population that this certain ecosystem can support. And so the population is going to hover around that point. Um, when you're looking at limiting factors that are keeping that carrying capacity down, uh, that could be space, there's not enough space to support any more people, there's not enough resources, and, there's not, and there are um, predators that are killing the uh, certain organism that we're speaking about. Also, uh, a differentiation to make is uh, a density-dependent factor versus a density-independent factor. So it's basically what it sounds like. So a density-dependent factor is a, a factor based on the number of individuals living in the certain um, ecosystem, while a density independent factor um, is a factor that just occurs regardless of density of the population. Okay, so uh, reproductive strategies. These are uh, pretty simple to remember. However, uh, they are important to remember because these are always good for a few points on a test or a quiz. So uh, here's the easy way. So basically, K select, um, think of that as a big K because that's an uppercase K. Um, and that basically refers to big animals, so elephants, humans, things of that nature. So basically, these are the kind of animals that reproduce, and they only have few offspring, but those offspring are um, more likely to survive into adulthood. Versus R select, keep in mind, lowercase r, refers to um, little animals. So think insects, fish, things of that nature. These are the types of animals that are likely to have a lot of offspring with a very, very low... Um, rate of reaching adulthood. So you're expecting a lot of those um, eggs to die before they reach maturity. Um, and granted, these are both two extremes and most species fall somewhere in between both. Okay, so uh, protection and conclusion. So basically, um, just as in with most environmental issues, social and economic pressures can cause people to provide relief to, uh, say, species going extinct or a lack of biodiversity. So just keep that in the back of your head always. Uh, but in conclusion, uh, it's important to understand basically how environmental pressures caused by humans or just natural causes themselves can lead to habitat endangerment and uh, the worsening of all these issues. Okay, uh, great. I will see you next time for chapter four.